is the I think this is the title of the panel. <laughs> Temperature, power, time, and energy can software control it all. Um, so I'll just be bold and say, all right, yes. <laughs> and no. <laughs> so how's that for a politician's answer? So, um, uh, so I think yes, uh, uh, but not necessarily well. Uh, oftentimes it requires either holistic knowledge or even uh, some access to mechanisms that aren't exposed to the software, and I think we can talk about it throughout the panel today. Um, and what it ultimately ends up uh, uh, winding up being is that you oftentimes have some type of co-design process between the hardware, the software, and the algorithms, and in particular alongside with the associated overheads in order to affect uh, the type of management that you'd like to have in the, in the, uh, in the power uh, energy, temperature, domains. And what I have kind of grayed out in the background there is, is examples of uh, some commercial technology that was out there that worked well for controlling the temperature and energy and, and power, um, but only for certain sets of workloads. And there, w there wasn't any way to, to expose additional information in order to, uh, uh, to adapt uh, appropriately. Um, there are also uh, all sorts of overheads and things that you just can't control uh, with software that are overridden. And so that's kind of the no part. It requires more holistic knowledge and control. Um, in fact, until recently, if you take a look at GPUs, for example, um, there, were, there were times that you would go in and you would, uh, through a software mechanism, you'd set the frequency and voltage and, uh, to a lower setting, and then you would run it on the GPU, and the GPU would just, the hardware would just override it. And it would it would write it up to the highest frequency voltage. It's not the case now. We have a few more knobs. We can control the frequency voltage of the processor cores as well as the uh, memory subsystem even. Okay. So, uh, so th that's the, the wishy-washy answer of it, of it all. And I'm going to just throw a whole bunch of uh, uh, anecdotal information your way to, to give you a better uh, perspective or appreciation of this. And then I'll, I'll shut up and sit down. So uh, this, this is an example. In fact, the last time that I was here to speak at uh, Illinois was, was about this Green Destiny supercomputer. And there was this embedded processor that was a Transmeta TM5800 CPU. And uh, it was only 6 watts. Um, and the issue was, was that, OK, so the issue was is that I had, I had a, uh, an esteemed colleague of mine that was kind of poking fun at it uh, back when being cool was not cool. I uh, said, well, the Green Destiny is so low power, it runs just as fast as when it's unplugged. And so, take it like a man, so to speak, and just say, all right, fine, well, here's, here's some of the proof in the pudding. And what you see is this hardware software co-design. We had two times faster and two times greener. And so we did that uh, in a couple ways. One is that we... Uh, through a co-design process with the hardware, we recognized that there were a number of, there's a lot of work that was being done at the systems level uh, with, um, with and without dynamic compilation that was causing the th uh, thermal energy to increase. Uh, and the other thing was is that there was uh, a dynamic voltage frequency scaling policy that was oftentimes making the wrong decision. Um, and that was what was in that uh, grayed out picture that I had before. It, it worked well for certain applications. It didn't work well for other applications. So hardware, algorithms, software again. Okay, so, and that software could be from system software all, all the way to applications. And so in this particular case, the system software that was regulating the, the power and energy was making wrong decisions for scientific work, uh, scientific applications. It was making the right decisions for playing video and movies and things like that. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about that. Just uh, go through that. Um, so here's in terms of uh, not making use of all the right information. This is uh, uh, I don't have it. Oh yeah, I do have one. Um, so this is. This is not state-of-the-art anymore, but it's just to give you an idea. This is a proportional integral derivative controller. And you see that in this case, this is all normalized to 1 in terms of uh, uh, time. And this is normalized to 1 with respect to energy. And so for this uh, controller, you see that there was as much as a uh, almost a 40% uh, impact on performance and a 12% uh, uh, reduction in energy. So it really requires a more holistic approach. Here you see that there's almost no 
impact if you're running the traditional uh, CPU speed or speed step. And then what we've done here is we've bounded it to 5% uh, performance loss and we get the associated uh, energy and power consumption uh, benefit. If we take a look at hardware, so this is, we've talked about performance and hardware, so this is a case where um, what I think is interesting here is that this is a, a, we could do it with any of the latest ones as well, the Tesla Fermi and a Kepler, but uh, we're running a code here and you see that the, the pe power peaks at almost 350 watts, it gets done very, very quickly. Uh, and then with respect to NVIDIA, NVIDIA ION CPU, GPU, uh, it's much, much lower power-wise and the things that our NSF Center for High Performance Reconfigurable Computing likes, but uh, the contrast is that, of course, you end up consuming a lot of energy. Um, so that's, uh, that's, this is just strictly hardware, and, and there's, we add, there's about 20 different uh, devices that, that go the gamut all the way from this green all the way down to this, this red box. Um, if we take a little bit more look at, the, at more some of the software interfaces, uh, there's something that Intel's recently put out for the Sandy Bridge uh, line of, uh, as of Romley, uh, Sandy Bridge Romley. Uh, different interfaces for power limiting, energy meeting, performance status, and power information are things that you weren't able to do or take advantage of until uh, the Romley system, which was released uh, probably about well, one year ago. And so what we're finding out through here is that um, I'm going to come back to that in just a second. We're finding that do data centers need to operate at peak power? And the answer is no. And, and there was a talk earlier this morning uh, with respect to uh, where the network uh, was consuming a lot of the power. And you're t generally operating uh, in uh, less than peak power. You're, you're, you're operating in non-peak power ranges. And so what ends up happening is here, if you take a look at this, um, the, if I remember the cock this morning was talking about working in this target uh, workload range of 30 to 50 percent roughly. And what you see here, this is, a, this is an energy proportionality gap. What uh, Barrasso at Google was uh, pointing out is like for zero percent workload, you'd like to use zero percent power. For a hundred percent workload, then you're going to use the maximum power of, of, of the system here. In this case, it's 320. And so this is the ideal. And this gap in red is what's called the energy proportionality gap. And what we're going to look to do with the uh, RAPL interface, in fact, it's being presented next week uh, at a conference, is that we want to start to look at this and use the interfaces to cap this power to squeeze it down so that it becomes more energy proportional while still maintaining performance. And in order to be able to do that, this is a system at, uh, that was a system uh, under test, and that was for the entire system. We started to analyze each of the subsystems within a, a, a computer. And it's because of this exposure to the hardware and the software mechanisms th that allow us to control it that we can control uh, temperature, energy, and, and what have you with, with software. In this case, this is the yes part of the, the question. And so here you see that. Uh, the, well, the Pearson correlation between these two is very, very high in that uh, it, it, it implies that the powers consumed by these domains have, have very, very high uh, correlation with the same particular performance counters. Um, and so there is room for us, if we were to take the power capping library and shrink this down here uh, to be closer to this energy proportional line and try to optimize performance with respect to that, that it is possible to bridge this non-peak performance time and still get the same performance. So what I mean by that is the idea is we're going to squeeze this, the, the distance between here down to a smaller sliver while still maintaining performance okay. under that power cap. And this has only been possible uh, through the exposure of this, uh, these hardware mechanisms through to the software and the RAPL interface. And what I think has been more interesting, so this one, uh, you could see that th that profile is, is such that we could control it. But there are some cases that we just, we're going to have uh, quite substantial difficulty. This is the uncore power. That is the power other than the, the, the core. It's constant, irrespective of the uh, load level, making it the least energy proportional part of the system that we could try and take a look at. And then the, 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 the memory is much, much less predictable in terms of the energy proportional gap. 
Um, so I'll just wrap up. Uh, it's at eight minutes, so um, I'll just uh, say that we've been uh, doing a lot of insights into the energy proportionality gap for a system as a whole, as well as the different uh, running average power limit domains, that is the subsystem levels. And uh, I'll leave it at that and, and point out that, I'll get back to some of the slides that I had before, is that what we're really looking to do is identify these portable predictors for performance and power. And in order to do that, I'm going to skip over these things. Uh, in the past, the portable predictor was really this uh, data cache misses uh, pre Nehalem. Uh, since Nehalem, uh, since the advent of Nehalem, it's become these particular uh, performance counters. And a lot of these things now that we are exposed uh, through the RAPL interface um, uh, that, that we didn't have access to before. And this is what's going to allow us to better control. Uh, the temperature, the energy, the power, and the performance of computing systems. That's it. My answer to the panel's question, which was really unknown to me until I typed it, but uh, uh, so is that, uh, yeah, software can control it all with an adaptive runtime system. What else? Uh, uh, so, um, so, well, the objectives of the, in this domain are we want to uh, uh, restrain, as I learned this morning, the core temperatures within a limit. Uh, we want uh, to use the power as a constraint. You don't, don't want to draw any more than X megawatts. You want to minimize energy. You want to minimize execution time, since you have two things to uh, minimize uh, uh, Pareto curves and trying to be on the Pareto curves uh, becomes the order of the day. I have seen in the papers, and this is somewhat surprising, that we see both views represented in papers uh, that are reasonably uh, current. One view says that power is a cubic function of frequency, right? We go back to a semiconductor, whatever uh, process or textbook, and you'll find that. And so, therefore, running at a lower frequency is, uh, and, and of course, running at lower frequency is only at most linearly slow. And the power, of course, is cubic. Therefore, makes sense. Run it at the lowest possible frequency if you want to minimize the power and uh, energy also because, uh, because it's only linearly slow as opposed to cubic uh, less power. And so that's one view. The other view that you hear often uh, is that if you want to save energy, run as fast as possible and turn the machine off. What's with these two different views? Uh, where do they come from? Well. They come from the hidden variable, which is the idle power, right? Um, so, so the first view is just going by textbook and is ignoring the idle, idle power. Uh, the second view is dependent on high idle power. So if you have a high idle power, reducing the frequency is not going to help you uh, save energy that much. Um, if you look at what's going on in the last few years, let me just uh, pick this particular uh, uh, plant, which I believe is the Intel. Uh, Xeon ES, uh, E5520 chipset, you can see there, yeah, where is the cubic? I don't see that much cubic. Well, that may be that you have to change the device parameters and so on. Do, varying the frequency on the x-axis, you get this sort of linear thing. But look at the base, 120, uh, 100 uh, watts to 120 watts. Not that much difference, right? Well, OK, as you go further in, uh, 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 in nearer, uh, more recent machines, it's only Sandy Bridge here. That's already better, 40, uh, 50 watts to uh, 100 watts. And Ivy Bridge is much better than this. I believe you can get, you know, maybe 20 watts or something like that for its idle idle power. So things are getting better. Even with these, if we actually talk about energy, not the power, then you can see this nonlinearities. Uh, st uh, starting to make an effect and creating minimas. And you can see on the left that the, for energy, you get a minima for these different machines at different different frequencies. Obviously, for the uh, for these, uh, the Xeon the f that I showed first, there is actually a slight nonlinearity which gives you smaller energy. But it's probably true to say run it as, as fast as you can and turn it off for that machine. But for the other machines, uh, processors, you get some uh, nice minimas. So that gives some control to the software. Software can do some things there. Um, let's see, I think I have. Okay, um, let's look, look at a second example. Um, 
so uh, this this took actually a per some particular computation but suppose you take some iterative computation and it goes through phases and let's say uh, it has three phases each phase might have a slightly different response to frequency change right in terms of how fast how slowed down it gets if you reduce the frequency uh, can we exploit that well uh, looking at the uh, nas uh, sorting benchmark uh, and looking at two particular division into two particular blocks uh, and the colors unfortunately are not something that i can say anything about but but uh, but i uh, but if you look at the um, hmm, there are two uh, two benchmarks see the red one is the time for the first entry method first uh, first code block execution block and you can see in response to frequency uh, as the frequency increases the execution time definitely decreases substantially the other one the green curve at the bottom is the second one well its energy uh, its execution time doesn't impact isn't impacted much by frequency both of them have the similar power curve which are the dotted uh, curves that are cli climbing up with frequency as as you expect so those those are similar and so this suggests Weak software can control uh, control that. And we actually have something called uh, EB Tuner framework, which does the following: it combines the temperature control that Usman was talking about, and it says if the core control uh, core temperature is above a threshold, we need to reduce frequency. Don't reduce frequency everywhere. Just pick the uh, execution block. Uh, that results in the uh, in the minimum timing penalty reduce its frequency if the temperature goes below the threshold pick the execution block that results in maximum time reduction and changes frequency one notch as long as you can do it otherwise you'll have to go to the other block if it is already at the maximum uh, frequency then you go to the next one so with that we actually were able to reduce uh, the timing penalty um, quite a bit uh, in the temperature control scenario let's say at 46 degree uh, temperature control we are able to reduce the timing penalty from 25% to 10% so software can do a lot so we can observe and control temperature we can use DVFS or more modern processors use power caps uh, you can do this dynamically the runtime can actually come in and change things at uh, uh, during the execution not just at the beginning of a run of a program and differently for each chip each chip can be separately controlled maybe tiles instead of chips in future if you look at the intel's experimental chips uh, you're able to control different tiles at different uh, uh, at different frequencies but most of the modern processors you can you have to change it for the whole processor and so you can do it but the pro one problem of course you have to be aware of it there is a cost sort of capital cost for making a change uh, and you have to be aware of that cost and so you can change it much too frequently so uh, so we have all those controls and hopefully the hardware guys will keep giving us these controls and more rather than taking them away from us and wanting to do the uh, what is good for us by themselves um, so that's one plea to the hardware guys and so but to use it really we do need an adaptive runtime system you cannot do that much if you don't have the control we saw in Osman's talk in the morning that he was able to uh, reduce the cooling energy by uh, by, by increasing the AC uh, th thermostat right but then the corresponding uh, and, and then making sure that the cores don't burn out by reducing the uh, frequency of the ones that get hot by every few seconds measuring the runtime system coming in and measuring the core frequency and reducing the frequency of those but if you were to just do that you would pay a lot more in energy because of the increase in execution time because of the slowed cores that are slowed because you change its frequency downwards but we're able to do the load balancing for those and that gave us the ability to bring the, uh, uh, the, the performance uh, execution time down and now we could actually save energy even cooling energy so you need these kinds of additional capabilities um, so for example for doing that EB tuner work that we talked about the fact that the runtime system is scheduling each a method execution the message driven execution it can look at the queue and say okay you are executing next or you three guys you should be grouped together I'll run you at this frequency it can do that and that control over scheduling is, is useful so I think this is one more argument in favor of over decomposition and the adaptive runtime systems that it enables. So I'll stop with that. Okay. So, I just comment. I think uh, that the power consumption is uh, uh, proportional to the physical frequency. I think it is uh, cubic to the voltage. 
I see. Oh, the assumption is frequency. When you change the frequency, you change the voltage correspondingly. That's that's why it comes like that. You're right. Yeah. When I got the question for the panel, um, I was thinking, so what should we talk about? And first of all, if it's not software, what's the alternative? What else can we do if we don't control it by software? Because naturally, my instinct was to just to say yes, and that's it. So I looked. Um, the option, of course, is as a pure, a pure hardware alternative. Um, that's what the, the hardware guys, the architects, typically want us to do. Let us take care of that. It's a black box, and we will do the right thing for you. As, as Sanjay said, they know better for us than, than, than we do normally. At least they think so. And so, um, so we started playing with the RAPL interface that, that Wu was also mentioning, and we started seeing what the current hardware actually does for us. And so we did an experiment. We had a cluster at Little where we actually have access to the RAPL interface. Um, and we took 32 nodes with two cores, uh, with two sockets each, with 64 um, of the of the Sandy Bridge processors, and we ran the same um, code on, on all the eight cores on that socket, and we measured the uh, the power and the performance we're getting. So in the graph, you see um, uh, you see the um, what was it? The um, the performance on the on the on the y-axis and the power cons consumption. I mean, it's the other way around. Sorry. Uh, you see the uh, execution time on the y-axis and the and the, the consumed power on the on the x-axis. And so, if you um, if you run the same code without any power bound, you get the, the data points down here. So you get the same same code on the same processor. You get the same speed. That's kind of what you expect. But the power range is about um, 10 percent. What happens though, if you turn on the, the, the power capping, uh, you reliably get the power cap. So each of these, these vertical strands is one experiment um, with a different power cap. So the, the processor now enforces the cap as it is, but the changes difference in the, in the power now turns into difference in performance. So you have a 10 different, 10 different speed of the same code running on the same processor that you bought at the same time. So now you suddenly have a completely heterogeneous system that you have to deal with. So that's what you have to do with a, with a pure hardware solution. So what you actually need on the realism side, you need a clever software, like, for example, an adaptive runtime system um, that can then fix this for you. Basically, you have to reverse engineer the hardware to actually make this work again, and, and you have to use software after all, even if you have a hardware solution. And the same, by the way, goes also for black box, low-level black box software system that try to take care of that for you. If you encapsulate that, that's kind of what you're stuck with. And this will get even more um, difficult once you have over-provisioned systems. So once we have systems that we, we know we can't power all of the hardware anymore, we're going to have dark silicon, we have to turn things off. And so now we actually just have to decide where to copy. We have to decide also where to direct the power to do this the right way. And hardware will not be able to do this because hardware doesn't know what's important right now in my application. I need to be able to tell that. So we need to get the application side or the software side involved in that and actually drive um, uh, to drive these decisions, and so the software has to be involved to, to a good part. Uh, on the other hand, the pure software solutions won't work either, in my opinion. Um, we all write bug-free software, of course, but in case someone else checks a bug into our, into our repository, we don't want this to happen. So uh, if someone else then, then does something wrong, we don't have a protection in there, we don't want to burn out the chips. So we need some basic protection, at least in hardware. And so we want to. So assuming we have these basic protections in place, and now we we let this be driven by the by the um, by the application. So the obvious solution is now let's let the developer drive this. So the developer they know exactly um, what to do. They know what the application needs to do. They know what's suitable from them. So as long as we can give them a, a couple simple ways to actually control the application, to control power, to control the speed, they can actually implement this, and they know what's best for them. So I'm going to look at Brian now and see if he's red or his head is starting turning red. So Brian is our representative from our Livermore Co teams here. Uh, and when we tell the, I mean, if someone would tell this to them, this is what they have to do. They first would do this, and then they would do this. <laughs> So this is clearly also not an option because developers don't want to deal with that. And this below is actually almost a, a direct quote that we got um, from a developer one time when we were discussing this. So you already tell me I have to do with caches, NUMA, parallelism, load balance, all of that, and now you want me to deal with power as well? So this is not going to fly. And so the only solution that I think will really work is uh, some kind of a system code design, basically what, what Wu was already um, targeting as, as well. So if you look from the hardware upwards, uh, you want to prevent catastrophic settings, so that's something that needs to be in the hardware. Besides it, expose everything else to, so we can play with it. And then from the top, from the, uh, from the application side, um, it would be good for the application to expose behavior, stuff that's known to the application developers, simple things, not low level, run fast here and run slow here, but high level things about phases, about um, the, the right behavior of the code. 
And so we need to work with them to develop the right APIs, annotations, or perhaps language. Perhaps a language like Charm may be enough to expose the right thing so that the middleware knows what to do with it. And then the middleware can then use this information, model power the right way, and with that hopefully do the right thing and get us the best execution for the power budget that we have. And so we have been working on this uh, on, in a couple of projects over the last couple of years. We, in this case, I mean, a, a very close colleague, Barry Roundtree, live more and together with David Lofenthal's group at the University of Arizona. Uh, so a system we've been doing a couple of years ago was called Adagio. Uh, the idea was you have a critical path for the application. And so once you're on the critical path, you want to run as fast as possible because that's what dictates your overall runtime. But if once you're off the critical path, you can slow down because you have blocking times, you have waiting times. So you don't actually hurt performance when you do that. So if you have a, um, um, the execution of an MPI program, you have messages in between, you have the critical path running through. So whenever you hit the critical path, you run as fast as you can, and in these green parts, you actually slow down, so you actually don't have long waiting times that you're actually just waiting for the critical path to, uh, to arrive at you. And so we did this with this location dynamics code, and we actually saved 20% of energy uh, with, with running only less than a percent slower um, you know, using just this approach. Uh, of course, what we did basically is we exploited load imbalance in the code. So the code was not fully balanced. It's inherent to the application in this, in this part. It's very difficult to balance this, this application all the time. And so basically by load imbalance, we have these wait times for messages to arrive. We can slow down at that time, and with that, we can save the AD energy. And once you have over-provisioned systems, again, where you can't power everything that you have, you actually have potentially even more flexibility by kind of keeping a, um, like a, um, a power reserve around and directing the power reserve to the right places within certain constraints in the system to actually again, keep the, the critical pass as fast as possible. So the key component in the system was that we needed to predict the critical path. We needed to know when we're on the critical path or not, and that's not always obvious. Uh, w while you're running. You can, after the fact, compute that critical path, but once you're running, you actually don't know that. So we needed to have some, some model, basically, that found this, and we tried to use only local information here because we didn't want to choose extra, com extra communication. And so we did this as a black box, and with that, we actually lost some of the, the efficiencies that we could have had, and we, there is a, still a margin that we can exploit. And if you just have some more application information, again, at a very high level, not as, I'm on the critical path right now, yes or no, but a high level phase behavior, uh, or, or uh, an, an announcements of phase changes or things like that. We can actually increase the accuracy of the model and with that increase the efficiency. And if just on the other side, from the harder we get a little bit more finer control, we can, we can actually not just say slow the whole CPU down or speed the whole CPU up, but as have individual parts of the chip even uh, direct power to, we can increase the benefits even more. And then a more, more recent work that we did is the, again, looking at over provision systems. So we did a, a, a test. We took a 32 node cluster. If you run that 32 node cluster at full, uh, you get about 6,350 watt that that machine at peak could consume. And so we, we now said, okay, what is if you put a power bound on the machine, assuming we can only get certain, um, a certain number of watts to the machine, what's the optimal configuration as point of how many cores we're gonna run, how many threads we're gonna run, how many nodes we're gonna run, uh, to actually run the, uh, the codes most efficiently. And so this is the Im Im improvement that we have over that baseline where you just pack it in and it run it on, a, on, on, a, on a very compact set of nodes at the, um, at the, that's allowed by the power bound. Down here's a different power bound. So here, if you take um, en enough processes to fill 2,500 watts, and you pack it in there, that's the baseline, compared to just using all 32 nodes in the right way and then capping the power and physically running slower on more nodes uh, to, shift, um, to, to get the, um, the, the best performance. And you can see you can get up to uh, over 1.5 um, speed up um, but just by picking the right configuration over the, the typical conservative baselines. And you see, of course, it depends on the application. Again, knowing more about the application can actually help do these decisions the right way. But um, again, if you have a scheduler, again, a software in this case that, that knows these properties and can schedule that, you can actually get quite a bit of improvement here. So again, there's a large potential here, but we again need to know the application characteristics. And uh, ideally, we want to know some of that before the run. So collecting historical information, keeping historical information around, and based on that, scheduling what's going on can actually, again, um, uh, help run the system efficiently. So the only solution, I think, my opinion is this, is we need a whole system co-design. Expose the knobs as much as you can. Expose application behavior to the runtime system, then the middleware can hopefully do the right thing. Uh, the challenges that I see is uh, you want to work with the hardware vendors to actually expose the knobs. Whenever you, you, you ask them to do that, they, they, their response is, you don't want to do that. 
Uh, and then we say, yes, we do, and then they don't believe us. So it's kind of, we're w working with them can be kind of tedious sometimes. Uh, you also want to work with the application side. What's the right API? How to expose this stuff? And then once you have that, you can actually work on the right power models and performance models. And with that, you can then make the right decision as go on. Uh, and then the other tricky part is, you wanna, this is a global optimization problem. You have to target the whole machine. But of course, you want to do this do so scalably. So you can't just run some global algorithm there. So that's, that's another challenge that, um, that's there. Right, that's all I had. If there are any quick questions, I'd be happy to take them. Yeah? Uh, on the, uh, what on the previous slide, the, uh, what, what nodes were those? I was impressed that you could actually better by using more nodes. So those were all bridge nodes. Those were dual sockets, eight core per, per processor, uh, per, per, per socket. But this was uh, one of our TLCC2 clusters. Was it the cap cluster Livermore or is uh, It's either cap or Merle, but they're identical, yeah. So I'll begin by lying to you and telling you I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> I also say that if I asked everybody in this room, is the Pope Catholic? I think 99.9% .9 of you would say yes. However, if I asked this panel whether software is the answer, I predict 100% of the people would say yes. That's how certain we are. Um, <laughs> so I, um, uh, I can say yes, too. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, but uh, most of what I'll talk about is just I, I just have some questions that I I don't have answers to that I thought so so I, I know that I've been on panels like this before the first thing you're supposed to do is ignore the question and then move on but I'll start by answering it so um, can we limit the power yes we can that's pretty easy we have tools that do that right we can we can do things like power capping in Intel systems and HP systems can we limit the temperature yeah that's pretty easy too we have lots of um, tools out there and software providers and so on that do that um, can we minimize execution time we can but that's really hard so we actually spend a lot of time trying to do that right we've been doing that for the last 30 40 years and we're still not that great at it so yes we can but it's hard and then can we minimize energy use yes we can but that's awful hard too and the reason is that energy is performance times time and time is execution time and refer to the previous question which is that that it's hard to minimize execution time and so um, I have a company that tries to do that um, and has some success but I think that the, all my colleagues um, basically did the same thing that I and I was thinking about is to break it down into hardware and software and think about it as um, you know the, the two sides of this coin so let's look at at hardware first and this is where I have my series of questions um, this is a, um, a, a picture of uh, a dual Intel Xeon system, nothing too special about it, and it has, um, forgive the, all the detail, you'll, it'll make sense to you in a second, but this is just time, but it doesn't really matter, this is categorical data. Um, on the, on the y-axis here you have power, and then you have a series of different uh, scenarios for the system that I'll go over in a second, and then you have a series of benchmarks, A, B, C, and D. A is idle. B is uh, a memory intensive benchmark, um, C is a CPU burn benchmark, which means a CPU intensive, and D is an I.O. benchmark. Um, and then the categories, uh, where it says 1M slash, uh, category 1, 1M slash 1.2G, means the number of, uh, of memory dims. So uh, it has uh, one, I think it's either four or six gigabyte memory dim, and then it's running at 1.2 gigahertz on the processor, and the processor has variable speeds, and we can plug and play uh, modules when we turn the machine off. So this one has six modules. That one has one module and 1.6 gigahertz and six modules. So, so my point here is to show you the variance in the power for various workloads and various system configurations with the same baseline system. Right, so this is my two Intel. So that's uh, number 1M is four gigs and 6M is 24 gigs of memory. So the first thing is that the, the delta in the CPU power is um, from 55 to 90 watts, right? That's running the CPU burn. That's the maximum delta that you see on this picture. The second one is the maximum delta for memory is 30 to, it goes from 30 to 50 watts so it's about 50 watts that's when you're running and not running stream. Um, the next one is whoops did I skip one? No I'm sorry. 
Oops. The next one is the delta for, um, maybe I said this wrong before, but um, from idle to, uh, to the max power, which is 90 watts. Right? So these numbers don't matter. The, the next picture really matters. This is just giving you a baseline to understand these pictures. I'm going to show you the same picture now with the GPU installed. Okay? <laughs> so this whole thing here is without the GPU. And this is with one GPU. It's an NVIDIA Tesla. Nothing special about it either other than it's a GPU. Same configurations, they're numbered 5, 6, 7, and 8 now, but we did the same configurations. So you're starting to see what matters here. There's a 40 watt difference from idle. So when the system is idling with one GPU in it, it's consuming 40 more watts just doing nothing. Um, the next thing is when I load the GPU with matrix multiply, it spikes 270 watts, right? which exceeds the total system energy that we saw, system power, from the previous example. So what does this mean? Who cares? Well, what you're seeing here in one system is a 270 watt swing in, f in about 50 microseconds, roughly. Um, with 1,000 systems, you're seeing about 270 kilowatts. Um, with 10,000 systems, you'd see about 2.7 megawatts, right? That's a lot. I mean, in 50 microseconds, you might get a call from the power company. It's a 63% total power swing. Um, and if you think of like speed up, it's a, it's a power up of 2.65x, right? Again, maybe not that interesting to you. Look at this. This is if I have a Keelan-like cluster. So Keelan is the Georgia Tech cluster that has three GPUs in it. The power swing in a single system, if we use our numbers to project that, I don't have numbers from the actual Keelan system. This is a projection would be 810 watts in 50 microseconds, 810 kilowatts for 1,000 systems, and 8.1 megawatts in 50 microseconds for 10,000 systems. That's 86% total system power max swing and a power up of 6x or more. Another thing to throw in here is what happens when we, with our design parameters today, we're trying to idle it less. I heard it mentioned in a couple of talks today. So we're trying to idle it less. That means the swing would get bigger, right? So that means this, it would actually exacerbate this problem. The next thing is what happens when we start over and underclocking GPUs. So Martin and I were talking earlier about what happens when turbo boost is turned on in a supercomputer. It's not fun. It can cause a brownout. And the last thing, because there were a lot of talks about temperature today, temperature tracks similarly. So you have to overcool a lot more than you have done previously. That's what happens if we let hardware take control. <laughs> What happens when we let software? So software might be the solution. Let's look at software. Here's another chart. I'm glad, I'm glad Bill is here because he'll appreciate this. All right. So this is a picture of just a FFT diagram. I showed a similar one in my talk earlier today. Uh, it's running MPitch 2 1.3. This is a free flat curve for the power consumption of the CPU, which is the top line. And I had a grad student go away and do this, and he came back with this chart, and I said, that looks nothing like my FFT. Go do it again. And he came back, and he looked the same, and I said, go do it again. And I made him do it about five times, and he came back the fifth time, and finally looking very ragged, and I said, all right, well, let's look at something else here. So it was the same system we had done previously, and it was a different chart. Well, it turns out that um, we were running a different, slightly different, newer version of Linux, so we reinstalled the old version of Linux. We got the same picture. We changed the MPI, and the picture changed like this. So we went from a newer version of MPI uh, MPH2 1.3 from 1.08, and look at the dramatic change in the in the power consumption of the CPU. I have no idea why this happens. I know there's some tweak in the MPI implementation that changes it, but the point here is that minor change in the MPI stack, major change in the power power profile of the uh, of the code. So software's not perfect either. There's also a lot of variety that happens. So this is another picture. This is a, a benchmark called IOZone, and this figure I need some explaining here. So it has a number of threads. So with IOZone, basically all the threads do the same thing, and they're doing an IO sort of read-write type operation. And um, what this is is the speed up of, uh, of, uh, of basically running just statically, not, dy not dynamic voltage frequency scaling, but just a static voltage change. So I run it at 1 gigahertz at all these thread configurations, and then I run it at 3.3 gigahertz with all these thread configurations. And so in most cases, the, um, let me think about this. Yeah, in most cases, the 3.3 gigahertz version will run faster, okay? 
However, this is the inverse plot. This is a plot of the speed up running at the slower frequency over the higher frequency. So that means I slow down the processor and I run 2x faster for this benchmark. Why on earth does that happen? <laughs> I think I have an answer, but I can't tell you. We're still working on it. Um, still trying to figure out why this happens. But again, the point is not, it's just, the point is simply that it happens. Why does it happen? I don't know. It's probably due to the complexity, things we don't understand about the system. So this is my last slide, I think, yeah. So, um, so the hardware itself, hardware is good, right? It's fast. It can, it can be static, so it, is, it's not, it can change dynamically, but it's also a bit st more static than software. It's very localized. The autonomous behavior of software can be troubling. Right? Software, it's a little s slower relative to, to hardware. It's, 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 some could argue it's better at being dynamic. It can consider things both locally and globally, which is a strength. But the complexity contains some gotchas that we don't understand fully. And a minor change can make a big difference. So. I don't have any answers today. I have more questions than answers, I think. The, um, we've got this problem where there's a lot of complexity, there's efficiency that we care about, there's a high variation in our results depending on the parameters that we change, and we have a local and global problem. And then we have our, our characteristics, our solution most likely are that it has to be both, so, so, both software and hardware, where it's dynamic, software, flexible, it's hardware, it's fast to give us the speed, so we need some hardware support, which really is a runtime system, which would, is what everybody has been saying. So, but overall, I would just caution that we have a lot to learn about power performance. Right. Did I finish? Two minutes over. I lied. Okay. Oh, oh questions? Okay, so my name is Mr. Sasato from uh, University of Pescuba and Riken. So actually, I'm uh, the original uh, the objective to come here is to discuss about the collaboration between the ASCS, the Mine Institute, and the NCSA. So, but uh, Sanjay told me to join the panel. <laughs> so, and uh, the panel agenda uh, Sanjay sent us is like this. So uh, the, the uh, the, as we are moving to the beta scale, the X scale, the power, constant, power control is very important. And the can, the, the can software can do something about the parabola. So, <coughs> so, I, um, so uh, fi almost five years ago, I was uh, working for, for, for the uh, power consumption and uh, power management. So one of the ideas is that uh, we designed the software to uh, control the power consumption by uh, defining the range of uh, the program segment by instrument code, and uh, that instrument code control the, uh, the power consumption by using the uh, runtime information or uh, the profile. And another thing is that uh, we designed some uh, the, the, uh, the web server system to. Uh, to, uh, to optimize the number of the, uh, the servers, and uh, 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 the looking by looking at the, the load. So, uh, but uh, so <coughs> generally speaking, I think uh, that the gain of uh, the DBFS, the, the controlling the controlling the frequency, will be getting small as the voltage driving the processes uh, the, uh, is getting low, uh, lower. That means that uh, previously the processor is running 1.5 uh, voltage, but uh, now is uh, uh, processor is driven by the voltage of the 1.1 voltage, and the two uh, the raw power, power uh, uh, the, uh, the processors that the, the, the voltage of uh, the processor is getting down. So that means that uh, we cannot uh, uh, get so much. Uh, the benefit from by controlling the voltage. So instead, I think of stopping the uh, the power supply, several parts, including the processors and the, uh, the disk and memory, and uh, 
network is more effective to control the, uh, to, to reduce the power consumption. So I think, uh, I'm sure, uh, they, they everybody say that the, the, uh, the software can tell to the, to the hardware where and which part uh, the power should be stopped and uh, controlled. So this, is, this conclusion is not so interesting. So instead, I think uh, <laughs> I'd like to much focus on the exascale. So everybody looking at the exascale. So, <coughs> so I think uh, the, the so, uh, software for the power management or optimization can improve the power efficiency of the 50%. The 50% means that the uh, factor of two. So, but uh, anyway, we need to compute. So, so that means that uh, there, there is a limitation of uh, the, the uh, power, power improvement uh, by the software. So, for, for example, we need, for, to, to the exascale, we need more power efficiency. So, in case of the K computers, our computers, so the power efficiency is almost one gigaflops per watt. So, and but uh, the, in the coming the, to the X scale, the, the if we have the power limitation, power budget limitation of the 12 megawatt per, uh, megawatt for the system for the X scale system, we have to achieve the uh, the 50 gigaflops per watt. So that is the 50 uh, times uh, the uh, improvement we need. So uh, this this uh, the chart is uh, uh, the taken from the report DAPA report up for the exascale software. So looking at this uh, the, the this report, so uh, the projection from uh, uh, the power consumption of the many cores and the conventional uh, the multiprocessor system is will be reached to the uh, uh, the t from uh, 10 to uh, 20 gigaflops per watt in a range of the 2018 to the 20s. So to break the exascale at the range of the 2020, we need more uh, uh, power efficient hardware like the GPU or uh, in this chart, that architecture is uh, uh, they indicated as the right node simplistic so to, but uh, the one of the problem is that uh, that uh, we at such kind of software uh, such kind of the simplest uh, the GPU GPU uh, we need uh, the software to make, make me, uh, to make use of them so let me say a little things about the uh, exascale uh, the project in Japan so uh, currently, uh, we are doing uh, the, 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 uh, the feasibility study project for the exascale. So uh, four team is uh, working. The one is the application, or three team is for the, uh, uh, the, uh, the system. So first system is driven by the University of Tokyo. They are exploiting the, the, uh, the next generation of the exascale general purpose processors. That means that uh, many core system, uh, maybe uh, that, that each node, uh, each processor uh, contained, uh, I think, uh, less than uh, 100. So, and um, I'm reading uh, the, the, the system uh, for the, uh, uh, the heterogeneous, that means that the accelerator system. And the last, uh, the, the team is working on the vector processors. So, and uh, we uh, the currently we are uh, the doing the research. Uh, we are planning to uh, design to the exascale uh, the accelerators for the exascale system. Though of course uh, the key uh, issue is that uh, power cons power and uh, and uh, storm scaling uh, system. So uh, this is the uh, some uh, the doc uh, description about uh, our. Uh, storm and uh, architectures. So I think uh, uh, that the, the point is that uh, the, the, that system is the many, many processors. The chip will be include uh, 4,000 uh, cores, but uh, it's controlled by the SIMD, and each core has the 
uh, the, the own uh, the local memory system on chip, and and the the main uh, the working uh, the almost competition in done on on the local memory system. That I think this kind of simplicity or the, the exploiting the locality is the one of the uh, the key point to uh, the low power system for the exascale. So we expect that uh, in this architecture, 50 gigahertz per watt. That means uh, the 20, 50 uh, uh, watt uh, the per chip. So still uh, to make use of this kind of uh, very strict uh, architectures, we need uh, the, the programming model or software. So I, again, this is a summary. <coughs> I think uh, the, the software for the power management uh, the improved the performance, but uh, maybe it's the, the 50 or, or uh, around that. So that uh, beside on this, of course, uh, we need uh, power management by the software, but uh, we need uh, more low power architectures. So the, for the exascale, we, we, uh, maybe we need a more uh, uh, dis disruptive architectures like the GPGPU or write the simplistic uh, uh, the architectures will be needed. The, we need uh, uh, the softwares, including the runtime system for the power management and the makers of them. That is my conclusion. Thank you. We can work in concert, but I think more uh, common say application is creating its own dynamic load imbalances. Uh, if you're just talking about power cap, you're you're right. But uh, uh, if you're talking about temperature, <laughs> that's not the same thing. It's whichever chip gets hot, gets hot, and you have to deal with that. So I don't know if I answered the question fully because I didn't hear the question fully, but. <laughs> Some the it's a comment for discussion. Okay. Other Can we comment on the comments? Of course you comment on comments. <laughs> I think probably uh, what uh, uh, Charles was suggesting was that basically you might end up uh, spending more energy uh, while doing the migration. Is that correct? Right. I guess my comment was that you, in some ways, you can, you can reduce that problem by using power balancing, right? It makes the load balance uh, easier if you can have some greater control over the power. Because you don't have to balance as much. And so if you have something that's slowly enough, you can still just speed up and use slow guys. Right? And so it can reduce the power on a lot of it. Oh, okay. I, I, I think I have to understand this. I thought that uh, you were suggesting that if you do migration, you are spending some energy while you do migration. So I was basically uh, saying that uh, that is true. We do end up spending uh, uh, spending energy while we do the uh, migration, but then you know it ends up in uh, in uh, in a trade-off. So how much energy you spend during the migration, and what are the gains after doing the migration? So if there is the reduction in execution time that you get after doing the migration is zero in more than what you spend during that migration. Then it might be just a good organization, but of course, if, if the OIR of doing the organization in terms of energy is very large, then of course, yeah, doing that organization might not be that beneficial in terms of energy. But as I said, if you want to just feel good, then we can, then, oh, that's the hard to explain. Okay, uh, other questions for the panel, comments? Yes. So, so far, most of what you're talking about is improving by 20% or maybe 40 or maybe even 67. Where's the 10x that we need? Where's the problem? Really? The problem is really. 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 Uh, I was talking about this at dinner yesterday. Interestingly, if you take a look at the Green 500 data, 
last year and projected the top machine on the green 500 to an exascale system and you did that for all the last uh, 10 lists and you projected it out to 2018, we would be generating power instead of consuming power. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, 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 you know, we, well, we were really excited. Like, oh, look at this. You know, of course, you know, we're like, okay, we were thinking about it. It's like, okay, when are we going to hit the proverbial wall on this? Um, we hit the proverbial wall pretty hard uh, in November. It, it basically completely asymptoted, didn't change from the June list to the November list. And so if that continues, we're looking at an exascale system that's going to be on the order of four to five hundred megawatts right now. Okay, so it was going really, really dropping. It was getting really energy efficient, very fast. And then November, it just hit a wall. And uh, we'll have to see hardware, software. I mean, that's still a pretty big gap to go from four or five hundred megawatts down to even the conservative estimates uh, between twenty and hundred megawatts. Or not connect conservative, aggressive. <laughs> I should say uh, estimates. So uh, it's a similar question, but sort of getting at, maybe because I'm a physicist, sort of the basic, you know, where is the power going is what your, your talk was, was about. You were talking about the measured power, but there's also sort of the physics of where the power is going. And, and presumably, that's going to drive the architecture that's going to get us the 20x, 50x that you need to get the exascale. So I was just wondering if any of you know enough <laughs> to comment on what sort of big architecture changes uh, are going to happen. Uh, uh, Features uh, the range of 2015. So uh, the, we have the, we can have the much transistor on chip. That means that uh, a certain of uh, the data can be fit into the, mem uh, the on chip. In that case, uh, the some kind of computation can be done only on chip. This I think I believe that this kind of things uh, much uh, improved much for efficiency. Yeah. <laughs> If I have a few questions, well, the answer is what I've been hearing from Shekhar and other people, uh, Shekhar Borkar and other people, is that you've got to go near threshold voltage. Um, so you talked about 1.5 uh, going down to below 1 vol voltage, just going to the threshold where you know uh, where this is, uh, a minimum voltage that's possible to do, do this without getting into the noise it's pretty low and but then you get into errors uh, a frequency of error increases and also at that voltage you have to be running at much lower frequencies and so you might get energy minima but you're uh, so in terms of uh, flops per watt uh, but uh, but you'll be running for a long time. If you want to complete the computations, you'll be running a very large machine then. So I don't know exactly where those those things lie, but that's one direction that I have um, uh, ob observed people talking about. Other people might have opinions on, uh, on near threshold voltage. Um, uh, uh, that's the notion of co-design. We're not going to get it from any one uh, we're not going to get all the hardware, we're not going to get all the software, it's going to be a very good market for everything we have to do that we're going to have to do in terms of code design. And the one example that I would give that I think that I put up a, a slide about is that um, when we were looking at the power capping and we were doing the spec power benchmark uh, at all the different load levels, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, all the way up to 100%, um, 
we found that and you show you, you saw those red curve the red gaps and that that envelope at the top well it turns out that when you start looking at 30 to 50 to 70 percent uh, workload that you're ending up using only about 50 to 70 percent of the actual power that is distributed to the system and so by using power capping you can still get the same performance um, but at 20 to 30 percent less power so I, I don't know if I articulated that part so, so the, the graphs that I had showed uh, this is what 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 the power is is supplied to the different work uh, the different uh, workloads and in actuality when you measure it through the, the RAPL interface uh, you'll see that you don't need that am amount of power it's been over provisioned and so at non-peak uh, points you'll actually be able to power cap and reduce the power consumption by as much as 20 30 percent without impacting the performance at least for those loads that are, that are farther down in the uh, percentage workload uh, category which was I, I forget whose talk was that it. it was talking about how most data centers are working at about 30 to 50, 70 percent uh, utilization I don't know if what I said made sense. I see some nods, but I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> These are physics problems, not computer science problems or software problems that I'm better at solving. Um, however, if you uh, and you have to solve the, this problem, I think you have to you have to give me, you know, huge amounts of compute for no power. So when you do that, then we're talking about the 10, 100 x improvements. But f if you don't do that, if you just give me near through near near uh, you know near near threshold voltage or whatever the equivalent is, you know, turning everything almost off all the time, like clock gating does, um, then it becomes an efficiency problem that I, I think I can help you solve with software. And so then I am bound by the extremes that you have in the hardware level. So, so in the stuff that we do, or at least that I do, is it's all about, you know, you have these variations, and that's why I study variations like the GPU swings and stuff like that, because it's those variations that I have to be able to handle, and I think I can handle them in software. Um, if you just let the hardware just go at it, it's going to give you these huge variations. And we have to ask the question if that's going to matter to us. If it doesn't matter, then we can ignore the problem. If, if it does matter, then we have to solve it, right? So. Another way of looking at it is if you work at near threshold, maybe you get 2x. And then if you work at near threshold, you get 2x. And maybe you use this power gapping uh, aspects at, at lighter loads, you get another 30 or 40 percent. And you work in these communication avoiding algorithms or data movement uh, uh, limiting algorithms uh, that, that are in vogue right now and you get another two or three X so I mean I I don't see it the <laughs> I'd be a little bit cavalier I'd be a little, a little bit cavalier but I mean, the point is is that I, I, I really think that uh, at least in the foreseeable future it's going to take this integrated approach toward uh, energy efficiency and performance in order to have a hope of hitting even the more conservative uh, conservative target of like 100 megawatts, which was one of the numbers that was in that report. Yep. No. Yeah, I didn't speak up. So, um, What I saw in the presentation and discussion was that what Professor Sato was uh, explaining seemed more realistic. We can't do as much in software. We can only help the hardware by adapting to the new hardware. Uh, so, and even that two x, do you guys have some more concrete uh, results that software, a combination of techniques for a range of application, not one example. The things, the power savings I saw in the examples were, like, I guess. Uh, they are because the hardware was not doing as well. With more work, maybe the hardware can do it automatically. Do you have more concrete examples that the software has dramatic improvement for a range of applications, uh, like more than even a 30%? I'm not talking about 10x. Uh, 
or even some extra extrapolation for future when software can have like a huge improvement. Um. So, so I think I think let me say this one quick thing, and I'll hand it over to you. But, uh, but I mean, I think Kirk said it. Said it. Or, uh, so, what else is there? The country you have to do the control o with software, anyways. I think. Uh, uh, I don't see how you can say hardware can do it all because hardware will try to do it all and it will mess up intra node, right? Across node, it will do something for one node and then we have to uh, come and clean up. I mean, so that basically means software has to do something. And uh, but then Professor Sato said something that kind of gives me. A, I was going to say, well, hopefully the hardware will, cre will create more options for us, being able to turn lots of hardware units, being able to give a DVFS over a larger range. But if it says if you are computing near voltage, we don't have that much of DVFS, so then that that's a concern. But I'm hoping hardware creates more options for uh, for the for the software to control. Um, but I don't have any better answer than that. You I just wanted to, to add to that. I think to just the, the internal thing is really the, the, the thing. Um, hardware, if you do this in the processor, can only control that processor and will never have the ability to look at the application, look in a global sense, like what we did with the critical paths. You can't find a critical path in a parallel application just from the one processor. So that's where software has to come in because you don't think you want to construct hardware that actually does. I think it's, don't even think it's necessary. Um, and at the end, you also put, putting some algorithms in hardware. So the hardware is an algorithm at the end as well. So if you have the ability in software to actually change that, to get the knobs that make sure you don't chip melt, but that's fine. Uh, but then you have to actually control in software, but actually even with a small microcontroller on the chip that you actually can reprogram and you can adjust to your application, I think you have much more flexibility and you can fine tune your, your architecture much more to the problem that you have. And you can, with that, basically um, get application specific system, you can tune your system, so you have much more flexibility with software than you have with the hardware that's done once for the mass market and then we have to put in our HPC systems. I think hardware is, take, hardware is taking a beating and we're in a building where there's probably 20 architects that are ears are burning right now. Um, <laughs> so uh, I totally agree with these guys. The um, I mean, architecture has its place, and so does software. Um, the um, the only thing I would add is they're actually right. Internode, internode gets you. You ask specifically about speed ups. Think about. I know I do a I know an example with my students um, in an architecture class I teach sometimes where I have them speed up matrix multiply by hand. And I'm sure a lot of you have done something similar. Um, think about the speed ups you get when you think about the caches and you use software to program the caches in a different way than you were doing it previously, and the change in the algorithms. These are the speed ups that you can attain just in doing a simple a normal cache hierarchy. Now think about a NUMA architecture and how you can program a NUMA architecture to be more efficient. You're talking about 10, 20, 30 percent improvements pretty easily in many cases. Now think about if you're also um, optimizing along the dimension of energy and time or power energy. And the same thing is true. So in the stuff that we do, I've done stuff with Martin too, where we've done like um, affinity mapping, things like this. I mean, in multi-core, even in multi-core architectures, whenever you have memory involved, whenever you have NUMA involved, where you put the threads and where you put the data for each of the threads matters a whole lot. There is an infinite number of possibilities that you can do. The hardware doesn't know where to put them all. Software has to play a role. So, and these things make big changes, big differences in anywhere from 10 to 50 percent performance at times. So, I think there's a, you know, there are big changes that you, and same thing with power. So, there are big changes that you can make. So. But I, I think uh, to be self-critical, I guess uh, you're 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 getting at us with respect to oh we're talking about 10, 20, 30, even 60, 70. But what about 10x and 20x? In fact, it was <laughs> the previous question as well. And is software going to be able to to do that? And we basically all said again, 10, 30, 50, 70 percent. And uh, so, so how much of it is going to be hardware? It, it, it's hard to say. One of the things I would be careful about that um, I've seen in the past. I haven't seen it as much recently, and maybe the guys that have been working in the area more of late could, could chime in here, is that you got to be careful with respect to, uh, we want to do hardware software co-design, but there are some things that get embedded now in the hardware itself, and there are control feedbacks in the hardware that are the decision-making process, like when turbo boosts are running, that if you put <laughs> your own software decision-making process in terms of scaling frequency and voltage on top of that, and it's in, in some type of you know, coarser-grained 
uh, decision loop that you could ultimately have decisions that are being made at the hardware level and at the software level that are contradictory to one another and then you can end up really hurting performance quite a bit. Um, so I mean that was, a, I guess what I just, I just said really isn't much of an answer to, to what you were all getting at but I'm just pointing out that I think that a lot of the work that is to be done is really a holistic one. I mean, he was talking about critical path analysis, but the, the, I, I mentioned uh, the power capping aspects. We, we're leaving, we're leaving, we're leaving power, we're wasting power on the table already just by looking at the power capping work that, 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 that we were just looking at. Uh, there's 30% of power that's being wasted uh, that we could simply cap and we would still get the same performance. Um, it's just the way that the, the hardware currently is. And so by, by, by Intel's RAPL interface exposing that out for us and being able to take advantage of it and, and designing the software in tandem with the, what the hardware is exposing to us, it gives us a benefit of, of fairly dramatic, I, I thought, I think it's dramatic, 20, 30% uh, without impacting performance at all. So that actually brings me into a question that I will would permit me as a, 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 a asking a question response to a question for the panel, which is um, is 20 megawatts? Why are we talking about 20 megawatts? Because someone made up that number at some point in time, I, and I know uh, partly how that happened. But but uh, maybe 100 megawatts is a more uh, reasonable goal. You know, 100 million dollar per year bill for an exaflop machine, and maybe that's mo more uh, m more doable. Do anyone has any thoughts on that? I mean, for that cost machine, that size machine, it doesn't seem financially uh, 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 wrong to have that kind of a bill. I think we'll go back and see uh, 10 years ago how much power the number one uh, supercomputer, actually they probably didn't publish those numbers, but uh, see see where we're at uh, back then and and, and uh, just do some historical uh, extrapolation and see, see if 100 megawatts isn't too unreasonable. <laughs> So, uh, another way to look at it is the power that major cycling instruments use. And 100 megawatts is not unusual for a large cycling instrument. Um, so, in relation to what Simon was talking about, the 100 megawatts, so uh, Simon comes from Lawrence Berkeley, was here a few days back, and he basically told us that uh, in order to run him back and in order to get to even the top 500, the access point system is predicted to you know, run for 24 hours. If it works at 20 megawatts, that's going to cost half a million dollars to just run the impact and be on uh, the, the top 500. If you run it on 100 megawatts, that's going to cost 2.5 million dollars just to run the impact and get on the top 500. Why should we run from stupid enterprise? <laughs> <laughs> position as moderator to ask I think the last question which is uh, there was a little discussion of algorithms but not very much it was either the hardware or the software uh, but the algorithms are going to really control how much power is used now when I think about that if I'm thinking about designing an algorithm I need a mental model for the cost of my operations as I'm deciding on my uh, algorithmic choices and what you've shown here is completely frightening in terms of having a workable cost model as, for insight. What do you see as the uh, path forward to train algorithm developers to gain insight into uh, the right directions for power? So that's my question to the panel. So since I control the mic, I will version. I, I grabbed it. No, no. I, I was going to uh, say some uh, something different. I think I, I would like to hear your answer about uh, as an algorithm designer. But so I reflect it back. But but I say what what is needed more more straight faced answer to that question is that we need to develop a cost model for algorithms that that has a unit cost for each uh, you know floating point operation, but also memory traffic and also across. Um, no traffic and express the cost in terms of those and then uh, th then then you probably have some kind of a formula for oh, oh, maybe a 
prior to curve depending on the machine and say okay tweak these parameters to come to the optimal of this curve that's that's about the best one can do i think uh, in this situ situation but i would at the end of the panel's answers i would like your answer as well <laughs> I just wanted to, to add one thing. Before we can actually even teach people on how to write better items of power, we need to first give them the ability to actually measure and see what, if they make different choices, there's actually an impact on power. And I think we're starting to get those tools. I mean, Kirk's tool has been around, but it hasn't been at widely adopted to the point that we can do it in every machine. The Sandy Bridge counters give us a little bit of impact in that, but also on the very specific parts. And so before we don't even tell developers um, how to what to optimize for? They're not going to be able to optimize. It's like giving them basically telling them to optimize the code without giving them a, a, a clock um, or, or a stopwatch. So that's the first step, and after that, I think you you have to start the teaching process. Yeah. So sometimes the the teaching process is is not that easy a one. In fact, you I like your slide about well, you mean that in addition to having to worry about the cash hierarchy. Uh, my registers and things like that. I got to worry about energy. I, I, I think that a lot of that uh, ultimately ends up uh, being something that the end user just won't deal with or want to deal with. So how do you deal with it with respect to yeah, communication, avoiding algorithms, or, or data movement, uh, moving, uh, avoiding algorithms? Um, I don't have a good answer for that, but what I would say is that just from um, some recent personal experiences that. With respect to the heterogeneous computing environment, what we're finding is, is that oftentimes performance and power consumption are hand in hand uh, from the perspective of the, the data movement aspects. And so we were doing a structured grid code on the CPU, GPU, and it was getting us slow down on the GPU, a 0 0.5 fold, well, 0 0.5 speed up, which is a 50% slowdown. Um, and it turned out to be associated with data movement, which also happened to have a lot of uh, power consumption associated with it. And uh, uh, leaving the algorithm the same, but simply deciding where the data would be residing and moved in order to enhance performance also gave us tremendous power savings as well because we weren't moving the data. So some of this, I think, uh, in terms of designing algorithms, we can do, uh, at least as computer scientists. Um, I don't think that that's something we could like, ask the end developers. It's like it's like you said, they're already, uh, you know, woe is me and, and, and <laughs> swearing up a storm at us uh, for having to deal with it. So uh, there, there may be work with respect to, um, uh, you know, we're doing work on com uh, communication avoiding algorithms, data movement avoiding algorithms. There may be a point where you know, the, the compiler is really going to come back in vogue big time, uh, as it is you know, with with the fact that we have much simpler cores on 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 chip uh, and you know, software managed caches and things like that. I mean, it's getting increasingly important uh, for people to to be in the compiler area and 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 do this optimization on the back end. Uh, uh, f away from what the, what the application would have to worry about otherwise. Uh, just add one quick thing. I, mean, I think you're going to see the same thing you're going to see from the performance side as well is that we're going to encapsulate those in, into, into libraries and the libraries will have the hero programmers that optimize for that, that know how to deal with that. Um, at least to a certain degree, uh, and that we can hide it from the end user, the, the, the programmers of the high-level physics of the application as much as possible, because otherwise we, we will overwhelm them. We're going to have some hero programmers that are going to run the Gordon Bell codes and, and do that kind of stuff, but if hopefully we can hide the rest in some kind of abstraction. Hopefully. In yet, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea on this question. Um, <laughs> there is, um, you know, we tried um, looking at the algorithm side of it. The, um, I mean, Sanjay is exactly right. It, I think the thing is, wh one thing, one way you could look at it, Bill, is if you if you think about it, is whether you're trying to design an algorithm for better use of power or energy. Because the, if you if you think power, I could probably come up with something in the sense that if you, that you can rethink just power, as soon as I use, do an oper perform an operation, I could probably come up with a power equivalency for it. But if you ask me, you know, what's the energy of a particular thing, then now I need to tell you the time it takes. And you know how good we are at that. We use PRAM still, right? We, I mean, I know people complain all the time about LIMPAC, but you know LIMPAC 
did not like just come to existence. We were we were designing algorithms, big O notation, which is computational count, and Linpack is basically a computational count, right? So, I mean, the fact that it doesn't do anything else is not that surprising when you think when it was developed and what it was developed for. So, um, you know, it, if we can get a, algorithm designers away from, like Sanjay said, away from just counting computations and thinking about maybe they start counting just transfers of data or something, then we could probably give them a better cost model. But I don't know. It's a really hard question. So I I think the the I like the uh, the, the stopping the powers uh, the con rather than the DBFS. So that means that uh, uh, we need uh, some interface to stopping the some several parts like uh, not only a CPU or ne uh, network or disk or something like that. So from algorithm point of view, I think uh, algorithm designer have to have the uh, should have the some. Uh, interface uh, to control the uh, the power consumption of some parts. For, for example, the the, uh, the recently uh, the algorithmic designer is uh, uh, much interested in the uh, communication avoidance algorithms. In that case, uh, the if uh, the communication is never uh, that happen uh, at a certain period, uh, the, the we uh, he have to specify from here to here uh, the the communication never happen. So I think in this way, uh, the, we, uh, the, the, uh, the some API should be provided to that algorithm, algorithms, algorithm design side. Okay, then uh, with that, uh, I think it's time for the next break, uh, where there will be lots of time to continue these discussions. Uh, so thank you for attending the panel. Thank you.